Hello, and welcome to Humans of Magic. My interview this time is with Victor Adame Mingus. Victor is a very talented magic artist and illustrator. And in this one, we're going to talk about his creative journey. There's also a ton of fun stories, like the auction where Victor sold his original Gris painting for... Actually, I don't want to say how much it is. You'll have to listen to the episode. Victor was quite an open book. He talked about things like magic celebrity, meeting his wife, what it's like to actually work as an artist for Magic the Gathering, and also his new project, which he is developing as a way to combat burnout from illustrating magic art. And so I found the conversation incredibly candid, and I couldn't help but smile or laugh as I was editing some of the episode. Victor is just an open book, and I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did recording it with him. Here's Victor Adame Mingus. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Victor Adame Mingus. I am a magic artist. I have been so for 10 years. Uh, I live in beautiful, sunny San Diego, California, but I was born in Mexico, and that's it. That's that's who I am. I mean, that's not all of it, but I am more, more things. Yes. <laughs> Let's start off with um, maybe a bigger question. I feel like sure. all creative people have a non-linear path to get to where they are today. I know that today you're doing magic and fantasy art. You've been doing magic for perhaps 10 years. Right. But what was your metaphorical wilderness? What were some of the biggest things that you had to figure out on your path to doing what you're doing now, which I assume is sort of what you really want to do? Like, what was that journey like? for you and you can describe it in any way any way you want no it's actually pretty simple i i needed to to know what uh level i needed to be at um yeah what what skill level i needed uh and i needed to know how to get there how to get there and who to talk to um so figuring that out was was one of the hardest parts because once you're told like hey you have to you know be like like that person uh or your art has to be comparable to to that one then then you have a goal like you know what to do then um and also like i mean I, it it's it's simple it's like weight loss right like it's just so simple just you know calories uh in calories out uh, stuff like that but actually doing it it's it's a hard part um so knowing what I had to do and who to talk to like that was that was the hard part and also once I talked to the right people they they gave me feedback they told me what to do so now it was, it was about doing it and finding out the tools uh, that I needed gathering all the knowledge and the skills to like actually get there and it, it took me a little bit but uh, once you once you know like once you have a goal then then it's just about following the steps that's a hard one, though, because it requires some yeah. sort of self-actualization realization. So how did you even know yeah. what goal you wanted to pursue? I don't know if you intended to always do art for a living or not. Mm. Um, no, like I, I, in Mexico, like that was not a thing. Like you, you've heard about uh, comic book artists in Mexico or Guillermo del Toro, people like that, but it's it's not realistic right it's not something that you strive for but i was i was always like you know good um so that was a possibility it was just about like finding uh, how to monetize it like finding a industry or something and it was it was magic actually that yeah it got me that um <laughs> that like eureka moment when when i started playing magic i saw the little names that that's actually my card you see the little names on the corner and you're like, I got introduced uh, to magic by a friend and he's like, you know, these people work for magic and they, they get paid to do so. Uh, and I'm like, okay, like that sounds cool, but I'm, I don't know if I can do that. Like, I don't know how, like who to talk to. And then it was until I went to college that I had a friend who lived, uh, uh, I think he lived a couple of years here in like here across the border and he was like a very big fan of Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con. 
Uh, so he always like used to like come and and go to Comic Con whenever it, it happened. And so he told me like you know like there's people like there's scouts uh, for companies, and I'm like oh I'm, I'm gonna look it up. So you know eventually that's what we did. Met up with uh, Wizards people and and everything else after that was pretty simple, easy. That's incredible. So you actually had magic in mind as a young kid just yeah. wanting to break into like I see the art on the card I want to be the person that creates the art for yeah. that card yeah yeah wow. I had like I had like multiple uh, plan plants right different, <laughs> because different it, paths right yeah right yeah uh, um, but but no nothing's nothing's for certain I like when it comes to art like you don't know that you're gonna make money like you play it safe and you assume that you're not going to make money. Uh, so I was thinking uh, comic books uh, or whatever I could do. And actually that's what I did before I started uh, doing magic. I started doing illustration for independent creators, uh, publishers, and not publishers, just uh, authors, just like you, independent you authors. You illustrated covers for authors, that's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. And, and stuff like that, like small things, and I, you know, eventually thought that if I just kept going, I would get to the to the bigger clients, and and I did. Going back to something you said, you said you're always good. How did you? Did you get a lot of validation from friends, family, people yeah. around you about artistic ability? Yeah. Okay. Um, and you're just kind of born with it, right? <laughs> I, I don't know because uh, I, I always used to draw and so did my friends in elementary school and we were all like pretty like same level uh, like we were all like competing against each other uh, who could draw the best uh, Dragon Ball Z character uh, but I feel like my interest was greater than theirs and I just kept doing it all the time like for them, it was just something they did at school whenever they like whenever we were bored or um, sure. during recess. But I just kept doing it, and I just kept doing it and doing it, and that and it was something I did all the time. And eventually, I started like you know excelling at it. Not not to say that I excel right now, but um, because I oh, feel I, like... I would definitely say you're up there. But <laughs> thank uh... you. <laughs> but. Did you? What was your practice methodology like back then? Did you just try to replicate Dragon Ball Z characters? Like, did you? Were you completely self-taught? Did you start? Like, yeah. how did you do your practice and your your thing back then? I mean, I was I was like ten, um, and and that's. I feel like it's it's different because ten year. I feel like ten year olds now are doing a lot of things. It's crazy. Uh, they have they have like the internet and they have all these tools and stuff. But back then, like I was I was ten, I was just messing around, being a kid. Sure. Um, and so yeah, like trying to replicate the characters uh, or getting comic books and and not tracing, just like copying uh, the comic books. And then that led to me trying to do my own characters or like like draw my own things. But there so was you... no like point of comparison there was no something that like for dragon ball z characters and, and anime and cartoons like yeah like if you did it exactly the same then it was good but for something that there's no comparison then how do you judge it right so that's where the validation came from uh, school uh, friends and family were always like validating or asking me to draw stuff for them so then then you know like there's a, a saying, I don't know who said it, but um, it says, just be the best you can at something and someone eventually would want to pay you money to do it. So that's like when you know. I mean, it wasn't a lot of money. It was, <laughs> it was change, but, you know, it makes you feel good when you're a kid. Was there ever a plan B or was this always going to be the thing that you occupied your mind and your future career with no no like that was it like i, I you're I gonna make around. it no matter what yeah but, well i'm gonna make it or fail uh but i i don't know what would have happened if i had failed um and so i i, I tell people that i i don't have any other skills 
I mean, I guess I'm bilingual, but who isn't? Uh, like, that's not <laughs> that's not a job. <laughs> um, that, that that's it. Like, honestly, that's it. Like, I I have no other skills. I yeah. I didn't know what else to do. Like, I um, yeah, I I don't know. And like right now, we've like I've done uh, questions with my wife, um, stuff like that. And and there was one that said. Um, like what would you do if you if you didn't do what you're currently doing and i like i have no idea <laughs> <laughs> be a bilingual something i don't know translator I, don't know. I, I thought yeah i thought like translator uh english teacher yeah Some, something like that yeah did you also teach for a while was that something you did part-time or full-time i taught when i was in college so I, I taught a, an art, a painting class for high school kids while I was in college. Okay. Yeah. Did you we enjoy We were that? almost the same age, which was awkward. Huh? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I did. It was, it was cool. Like, I, I didn't do it for the money because the pay was, was terrible. Um, I, I honestly did, don't remember why I did it. It's been a while. But yeah, like I, I did enjoy it. I, I think I was like just like labor experience, work experience to get something in my resume. Uh, but it, it was it was fun because because high school kids like they don't want to do math. They don't want to. I mean, some of them do, but most of them are kind of like distracted or just want to you know mess around and, and have fun. And art is something that that anyone can enjoy. So I was pretty open. I was like like there's art for everyone like there's no excuse like like this is not this is not a chore like this is something that you should enjoy mm -hmm. so like pick one like pick pick something mm -hmm. out of like all the history of art like there's got to be something for you mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be painting or, or drawing it could be you know something else right so you were um, the cool teacher that everybody liked because you were just say just Creative expression. Let's just do your thing, you know. I mean, no, I was, no I, was right putting up, yeah, I was putting that position because I was the art teacher. If I had been like I don't know, gym teacher or something, not that I could ever be, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're the art teacher. It's gonna be, it's gonna be fine, right? I'm loving this conversation so far because Thank you, I me feel too. like everyone that I talk to, and you're no exception who is quite accomplished and I would say you are quite accomplished like thank you there's always this tendency to undersell what you've done and it's like and, and it in, in a way it's impossible to sell what you've done like how can you describe to somebody in 10 minutes like exactly everything that Victor's gone through but I feel like you you skipped over a bunch of details like for example how did yeah. you even start um building a portfolio and actually selling your work like like, what was that process like? I'm really curious because there was a whole number of steps you had to go through before you could even be considered to be a magic artist. So I'm curious oh, okay. about the early years of uh, Victor Adame, in a way. Ah, uh, building a portfolio. Yeah, that's that's also one of those easy things that requires a lot of work, but it's it's simple. Like, you just find the company, um, find what they're looking for. And, and magic is not... Um, it wasn't how it, it is right now where they have like a lot of styles and like with secret layers and all those things like anyone like like regardless of style can can do it but back then it was a little bit more narrow where it was like the high fantasy uh, realistic you know that sort of thing mm -hmm. so it was like finding the company finding find out what they're what they want and just doing it and right. And I was fortunate to meet people from from Wizards at San Diego Comic Con that were scouts, but also gave like their art directors like they also gave me feedback as if I was one of their artists. So they told me like work on this, this, and that. This is what we're looking for. So mm -hmm. I got like pretty pretty concise feedback as to what to do, mm -hmm. and it was just a matter of trying and 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 doing it. Like I I didn't get like. I didn't get in the first time I applied. It took me a while. It took me four trips to San Diego, four expensive trips trips to San Diego um, until I did it. But but it was like every year, like um, they they would tell me like you're you know you're you're better than it was it was the same person two years in a row. 
And I was like, oh, yeah. Like, so it was like tryouts. Like, you get some feedback. Like, you know, yeah. come back. You know, work harder on this. And uh, yeah. maybe some directional feedback kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. So did you have a style that was already quite congruent with what magic art direction was? I assume it had to be because it wasn't like you had to do a 180 on your art or your your style or like there's like is it are we talking about some tweaks or like uh, can you give me an example of like just inside baseball like what kind of things have did they tell you in the early days that you had to go back and maybe rework a little um well basically card art has that has its own rules and i just had to know the rules of card art um the style was what I was doing was fairly similar, like I was doing fantasy already. Um, yeah, you said high fantasy, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and I was doing a lot more sci-fi than I, than I am right now. Um, but uh, card art, like it, just like as as I mentioned, some rules. I'm gonna pick one of my cards right now, um, or people can look it up on the internet. <laughs> but um, it has to have like a strong silhouette. Um, I don't know if that's a good example. Um, it has to have a strong silhouette. It has to be believable. It has to, uh, the character, uh, which is what I did. I like I didn't do like magic um, spells, instant sorceries. I, I focused on creatures. So I had to be doing some sort of action within an environment. And bonus points if there were other characters around supporting that action. Uh, so that was one thing. And also, like, bringing back to that, um, knowing what you want to do, right? Like, if you're a landscape artist, you know, doing the lands, like, focus on the lands. And that's has, like, a completely different set of rules. Um, spells, um, artifacts, that, that sort of thing. But I my thing was always characters and, and creatures. I'm sure you get this question a lot, but uh -huh. this question is almost too deceptively simple. But are, is there something that you might advise somebody if they want to make art for magic? Like, is there was there something in particular that, or things in particular that worked for you in your past? Hmm. Um. Yeah, specialize. Because, because honestly, like, like how I said, magic has changed a lot, and I don't know what they're looking for anymore. I know that I get I get constant work all the time, but for someone starting out right now, um, just be as good as as you can possibly be. Like, just get get as good as you can you can be. Learn a lot. Uh, specialize on on a subject. Like like be the best you can at it, and and eventually like you'll you'll get noticed. It might not be for like the main line magic products because they they want something specific but you know they're always doing specialty secret layers and like all these kind of different arts so it's one thing to be so dedicated to the craft like jay-z locking himself up in his room like three summers in a row to to make beats or lyrics right like obviously you have to <laughs> make great art but what are some of the intangibles as you mentioned going to comic-con or san diego a couple times i assume there's a huge mm -hmm. networking or also like selling your work or putting yourself out there that's quite important for artists i don't know if i'm reading too much between the lines but... mm -hmm. not as it used to be uh because yeah back then like you had to know n not people in person but online and the communities were small uh, social media was not as as big or at least like artist social media like right now you can you can connect with anyone you want um but networking is is important but i feel like like what you said like selling your work like that's more important in in like my position where i sell the, the paintings um but that's mm -hmm. that's different uh people skills um it's yeah, it's a cliche that that, or not a cliche. Like I, I feel like yeah, most of most of us are introverted. Cliches can be true. That's why they're yeah. cliches, right? Most yeah. of us are introverted, and and I am too. Um, when it comes to like, I don't know, football and stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> but when it comes to art, I'm very extroverted. Like I can talk about it for for hours and hours. Um, it's just like train those people skills, like 
develop those those people skills and like if you if you know that you have um some weakness work on it um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and yeah intangibles there, there's a lot of stuff that that is not just art making um mm-hmm. it it helped me because like right now i run my auctions um, I didn't used to, I had an agent and like, just like being hands-on, you talk to the people, you know, you, you talk to your clients, the people that are actually buying your artwork and you know what they, they want, you know what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, they tell you about themselves. Um, you like, you establish meaningful connection and like, and like even friendships and you, you establish connection with them. And I feel like that's, that's really important. Right. I mean, I was introduced to you because of uh, a fan of yours that was listening to Humans of Magic. And uh, and <laughs> he said, James, you should interview Victor. And uh, here we are. So I guess it, 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 yeah, you do make that connection with mm-hmm. your, I'll call them fans or people who enjoy your work. Right. And I, mm-hmm. I feel like it, there's no right or wrong way, I think, because like with any kind of um, creator business, some people choose to outsource or delegate it to, like, for example, most artists I think have agents and sometimes agents like take care of a lot of things. It sounds like you do some parts of it yourself, whereas maybe other things you may delegate to somebody else. Right. Yeah. I, I I do have agents for all sorts of things for the signatures, for the artist proofs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I, like I want to delegate as much as possible, but I feel like there's some aspects that you like have to do. Everyone's different. Right. Mm -hmm. This, Mm -hmm. this works for me. Uh, Um, yeah, I just, I just like to do it. Like that's, that was one thing. Yeah. And I, I used to delegate my, my auctions, but I felt like I was missing something. And, and honestly, like for me, they're fun. Okay. <laughs> for a lot of people, they're a headache, but is it, I, is I it fun them. to see like, Oh, there's interest and like the, the bids are coming in and uh, who's yeah. bidding on that? Yeah. Yeah. It's there's a kind of a rush, right? Dopamine. It's like, it's like buying a lottery ticket. Like, the anticipation, oh. like the moment, like you just up don't to, know, right? Up to yeah. like knowing that, or up to like the moment you lose because no one wins, <laughs> no one that I know wins. <laughs> but like that, that window of time where you're like, oh, this is exciting, I could win. Um, and just like seeing the bids come in, um, and also, what's the craziest lo- uh, auction experience you've had? Uh, one where I set a buy it now that was it was achievable like it was up there it wasn't unrealistic but i i was not expecting that um you mean someone to just buy it right away or what yeah yeah it was grist yeah grist the hunger tide so that was my that was like the craziest one because i think um yeah the the buy it now was thirty five thousand. um yeah, and I and I set it up like I want like like I, I achievable, but no one should be buying it now right away because we're bidding, right? Yeah, it 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 depends. Um, so like I set to buy it now. Look, I I love my my art. I yeah. like the effort and the work that I put into it. Yeah, one of one. Yes, like yeah, like I I believe it costs that. Like for me, like if it was up to me, like right. like hundred thousand, like for for all the work that I put into it, I I feel like that's mm-hmm. what it should cost, and I wouldn't like BS people and put like a super mm-hmm. high up price just like mm-hmm. to make you know to embellish it, make it make it seem that it's worth more. Like mm-hmm. that's what I wanted to get for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the market's different, right? Like it's it's worth what people are willing to pay for it because it's a commodity. So I had set up the, the 35K, uh, buy it now, and people were like bidding slowly but surely, and I think it got to like 10-ish, and someone was like, you know that screw it, like I'm just gonna buy it. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> and it was immediately, it was almost immediately, it was for first day. It was probably gonna close at less than 35K, but someone just really wanted it. You never know. It's, no, it it's always over. it's always a gamble like auctioning uh, paintings and also like offering them private 
setting up your own your own price you could you could lose money uh, you can make more or even if you auction them you can you can lose money or you can make less so you mm -hmm. never know it's it's always a gamble like there's never a sure way that sounds like such a tough thing it's almost like how does one even learn that stuff and you probably have to learn through the school of hard knocks like you probably have to make yeah. a misstep here and there to really calibrate it and figure it out right yeah. there's no school for that yeah like i've had people offer a certain amount on a painting and then i'm like I'm like no i'm not gonna take it i'm gonna auction it and then ends up uh, being lower at auction <laughs> oh. stuff like that okay i'm just wondering if now now you have a pretty good you must have a pretty good grasp of at least your market value and the the market value yeah. of your works right yeah like it, it's not math but yeah you you, you see like a trend um it's mm -hmm. it's more a an art than it is a science yes it is an art it is an art <laughs> yes <laughs> so tell me about some of the initial works you did for wizards what was that like just initially working with the art directors and just what was it like and maybe how is it different from what it is now which is obviously going to be much more mature hmm. and established 10 years later um like what were some of the first uh, commissions you you got? Do you remember like your first? Oh yeah, I have, first I have them. I have them right here. Yeah, uh, it, it's hard for me to say because uh, one, it's been so long, mm -hmm. uh, and and the sets and the releases were very different. Um, I feel like now, yeah, like my first one was um, Bastion Protector. I'm looking at it right now, and then Garrett Poor Gear Crafter. Valorous stands, and I did a couple pieces for uh, for the books. Mm -hmm. Like, remember they used to uh, put up put up art books and stuff, or like yes. um, like the, the story art, beats. The and stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, the they still do that. Uh, I'm just not doing those anymore. Uh, but the story that they publish, like they some they have some arts uh, the art commission special especially for those for the story. Mm -hmm. So I had some of the origin one for uh, Liliana. Didn't you also do the board game? Right, yeah, I'm looking at those right now. Yeah, the board game. Whatever happened to that um, board game? Then some some Zendikar, and honestly, like I I didn't know what I was doing. Like I was just having fun, and and it just felt so uh, like I well, didn't have. I want to dig into that. It. Were you having fun, or did it feel like there was some pressure? Like you had to prove yourself. To... Oh, of course, yeah. But that okay. was fun. Like, like I, I still, I still have that, but okay. not so much anymore because back then I was, I was new, and it's not complacency, and but maybe it is, um, like being established and and no, it's just different now. Yeah, and like just having like your skill sets validated over and over, like you kind of get used to that or mm -hmm. confident maybe like even arrogant at some point well it's earned too right it's just like yeah. if i did something for 10 years of course i'll have the experience to back it up right um so yeah back then i was like really really um yeah um what, what, what did you say like how do you call it like trying to prove myself there yeah there you go and also like yeah maybe a proving ground yeah yeah and also like not competing but also like measuring myself against my peers uh, like seeing what other people were doing, and I'd be like, "Oh, like that's that's really cool. Like I wanna mm -hmm. I wanna be as good as as they are." And so it got to a point for me where I, because I was doing digital art back then, um, specifically. What that was one of the things that I learned um, through the industry, or that I assumed that people wanted digital art. I I don't know why I assumed that that was the case, and everyone had a, a one of these uh, Wacom's. Um, the tablets. Like that. Yeah, sure. tablets. So, so I assumed that that's what, you know, that people wanted, but it was not the case. And then it, it got to a point where I, I, it was getting repetitive. Like I was just doing the same thing over and over. And I feel like I, I got in a rut and I needed some change. And that's when I started um, doing paintings, oil paintings. 
Also, the so you started now. doing paintings after you started illustrating magic cards. Oh, much, much longer. Yeah, like I'm flipping through them right now. Uh, so I'm like Ravnica, uh, War of the Spark. Like I was still doing digital art. Um, mm. And then one of my first one first ones was a core set I did Disenchant. But like fully, it was Theros. Um what was it called? Well, where they go to the end? What was the last last Theros? Not the first one. I don't remember one. either. I have to look it up. It's been it's been a while. It's too many. Yeah, but Theros, and then after that, I kind of like went back and forth. I had some uh, some Eldrain. Oops, sorry for the boop. Some Eldrain pieces that were digital, and some some of them were traditional. And I was just like trying to get the the hang out of it because it was it was really hard at first like meeting deadlines and also maintaining a, a level of quality i was taking four commissions uh every every wave but after after I started painting i, I just took one because i like it was just so demanding was there ever any doubt to switch over to oil was there any doubt anxiety with making that transition or were you just confident that that's the way I, my art is going to be huh um no because I could always go back mm. if I if I messed it up I, I could always go back and and also I had like I, I did uh, traditional painting I, I always did oil painting in school so I knew how to do it it was just a matter of time of, like repeating that until you get to a certain level of quality and speed but I already had the, I already had the foundations uh, digitally. It was just a matter of like doing it, doing it in physical medium, over and over and over. So you strike me as someone who's always been quite intentional with where he wants to take his craft or his creative work. Like, thank you. Is that just is that just a commonality with magic artists? Like, I, I'm sure you've interacted with many magic artists. Is that what a lot of you folks are trying to do is like upgrade your skill set, try to figure out where the where the path is going or where the industry is going. Is that just a is that an important mindset or attribute to have? It it depends. I like I can only speak for myself, but like it depends on what what your goals are. Um and it's like for me like I would just want to just want to have like the stable magic commissions and like just like do it and, and collect the paycheck and that's like amazing but I like at one point I, I get bored of it I, and I feel like everyone does like if you're like doing the same thing over and over you kind of want to change you want to want to want to challenge but also I feel like there's folks that have you know kids and stuff and that's a challenge that's a huge challenge so they want a, a stable job and and like for me, like I don't have uh, responsibilities like that, um, so I'm like always like looking like for new things, uh, stuff to do. And but I honestly, I, I feel like every artist is like that. I mm -hmm. I don't know, but I, I assume so. Everyone's always like trying to get better and like find new and interesting things to do, and also like to because because we're told what to do right like we get a brief we have to follow the brief but like we have like little windows where you can explore your creativity like you can you know do things differently like outside of the brief or i mean within the brief but you know yeah there are, there are like, constraints but you can play within those constraints or make some things open-ended yeah so i feel like we're always like looking for that uh, and try yeah. to have fun because yeah that's that's like the thing like trying to have fun like enjoy it and getting a commission and thinking about like okay how am i gonna make this fun for me like how am i gonna do what the client is asking me how am i gonna make the art director's work easy and how am i gonna have fun and i feel like that's that's always a challenge and always like the problem solving that that we're encountered with mm -hmm. that i feel like every artist uh, that works in magic or that at least the ones that I uh, that I interact with are like that 
So, don't name any names, but do you feel like there have been artists that you've interacted with or know about that have sacrificed their own fun to sort of fit the other concentric circles, like stakeholders and expectations, to the point where they're kind of just completely doing it as a job. There's no actual fun or enjoyment because they're just trying to make something that they know other people want. No, I feel like if I feel like if that happens, because um, because it, it was it wouldn't like, last in that position. Then, no, right? like, like you, guess, you wouldn't yeah. you wouldn't do it. Like you would stop doing it if you if you're not enjoying art. Then then I feel like there's other careers that are that are better um, mm-hmm. for that. This is kind of me poking, but I'm wondering in your career with Magic or with Wizards. Were there points where you came close to being challenged to continue or feeling like, you know, this might be the last straw or anything of like that? Were there any challenges in that 10 year path where you felt close to burnout or however you want to call it right now? Yeah. Um, tell, tell me about it. Tell me more. So. I don't know if you follow me on Instagram, but I, I just posted something on Instagram not too long ago. Uh, basically announcing me, like, taking a little step back. Like, I'm still going to work for Magic, but I, I've told um, I've told my peers and art directors about it. Yeah, I have a post on Instagram. It's, it's a small rant. Uh, but I actually say, like, I feel like I've gotten to a point where... I want to explore different things and I want to, I, I want to do my own thing. Like I always wanted it and I feel like it was a mistake of mine to stop doing personal art and I was just like doing client work, client work, client work. Um, and once I, um, once I did my secret layer that I got the like, complete creative uh, freedom, mm-hmm. um, I was like, whoa, like this you, is awesome. You felt it. You felt that again, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I was like, I don't know if I can, if I can go back. Like this, this was, this was like amazing. Uh, and there's like commissions here and there where, um, uh, where you can have like a lot of freedom. Uh, but they're like few and far in between. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't getting. I feel like old magic was more like that. They were like, oh, just, just paint like, you know, a cool night and we're a cool you know creature and and that was it but now it's like a a little bit more specific which is good like if you're trying to build a brand you need to like be tight like have that like aspects tight it's just trade-offs yeah Yeah. but yeah right now like i'm I'm feeling like like i need a not a reset like i'm i'm still doing magic like I'm, I'm going to continue taking magic commissions. But you now. want space for your personal projects as yeah. well, it sounds like. Yeah, so I was doing I was doing around 16 paintings of magic commissions every year. And this year, I think I'm doing five. I'm not an artist, but that sounds like a lot. That is... Yeah. You're doing oil <laughs> paintings. Literally, yeah. it's more than one a month. Yes. Yeah. More than one a month. In December... You've been grinding, my friends. It's December. been grinding. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's... I have... Like, I don't know They if, talk uh, about magic players grinding. Like, what about <laughs> magic artists grinding, right? Uh, like, I, I didn't grow up poor. Uh, I come from, like, a very comfortable middle-class family in Mexico. So we didn't, like, we didn't need a lot of things. But I feel like I always had, like, that, that mentality where it's, like... I need to keep going. I need to like make more, do more. Um, yeah. And I feel like I've, I've heard that from, from people that have escaped poverty is like, even if you're well off, like you, mm-hmm. like that's still in your brain. Yeah. Uh, so it's yeah. Kind of like an actor, right? Like yeah. you know, when an actor gets a lot of work, they've had all those years where they didn't. So George Clooney is still, I, maybe that's a bad example, but like just insert name of like famous <laughs> actor who's yeah. still in Hollywood. Like, when they get hot they're doing i don't know how many movies a year right like i feel like there's that uh i don't know if this is the right term but like kind of a scarcity mentality it's like get going while the going's good kind of thing yeah bank it while i can yeah and it's really good right that's the thing like i kind of yeah it's kind of like 
if you see it from like the money point of view like i'm doing so good right now when it comes to to the market like like my my paintings are sought after and, and people are paying good money for it like i'm one yeah, of the top 35k people. for that Chris. yeah yeah and and yeah a friend was like like you just like you just got here like it it takes a long time to get here you just got here and then you quit and I'm like, okay, I'm not one, like, I'm not quitting. You're not I'm, quitting. No, I'm just taking a little little step back because I yeah. want to find that that balance. Um, and there, and it's some, there's something that I really want to do and and that I have the freedom to do it right now. So I'm, I'm going to take that opportunity. Yeah. But, yeah, to your point, um, I last December I did five paintings. And, and that was a lot. Just in December. Yeah, one month I did five paintings. That was a, that was a record. Did you for me. did you sleep? Oh yeah, I did. <laughs> but I woke up I woke up at six a.m. every day, and stopped yeah. working at like around eight p.m. Yeah, and that's not great. So all that, your waking hours, pretty much. Yeah, that's that's not great if you want to have a life. Um, yeah. And and you're running auctions and other things too. You have yeah. to maintain your business. Yeah, and like you know, a family and and. Yeah, like, you know, live to work to live, like not the other way around. Don't live yeah. to work. Yeah, but yeah, you, burnout's yeah. real. Oh, I'm sorry, burnout's real. No, no, I, I was just <laughs> burnout is real, and I was just yeah. going to ask, like, you mentioned having a, a decent background, as as did I. I had a decent middle class background, so I was never mm -hmm. for me it was never like, oh, am I going to be able to eat tomorrow? And I I understand that for some people, like pressure makes diamonds, but. How did you make that internal, like, your grinding mindset? Like, where do you think that came from? I'm, I'm just trying to, like, hmm. how did, like, did you always know how to work hard, even when you're, you know, drawing Dragon Ball Z characters or what? No, I feel like I was just dedicated. I feel like I have a very obsessive personality, um, kind of an, an addictive personality at, at some point so you do something and you're just like i want to do it to the to the max or to the best yeah way. and and i just got to like that i don't know it, it, yeah it was it was always scary to like not not make enough money like i knew my parents were not going to support me forever and then my dad was terrible with money uh so like he he didn't do he didn't like make financial decisions for the future it was just you know that was it um, and I could have like been okay, um, mm -hmm. but I I knew I had to like do something like like do it, and and that was always scary. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was overblown, like that's you know stress or you know you always think about like the worst possible outcome, and I was mm -hmm. always thinking about that. Um, but yeah, I I don't know. <laughs> It's also an impossible question when you ask somebody, yeah. like, what makes you who you are, right? Like, there, there was no other life that I lived other than the yeah, one I no. lived. Like, I don't know. Like, yeah. You know, I grew up and I, you know, did things and went to school and lived life and somehow, like, that made yeah. me. And... Have you ever thought about it? Was there, a counter, was there, like, a counterfactual alternate reality where there was a victor who didn't work as hard and is, like, like, doing something else? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I feel like I, I never think about that, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Just I feel keep like moving forward, right? I, I yeah. feel like my life could have taken like different turns at like certain points. Um, and I feel like my life would have been different. Um, I'm glad it didn't. Uh, it was like, it's like right now where I am, like, like I'm, I'm so happy right now. Um, like I'm married to the most amazing person in the world, and we have a great house. Well, we don't have it; we rent it, but it's still pretty cool. Um, we live in a in a great place. Like everything's great right now, and I'm, I'm like mm -hmm. so glad that it mm -hmm. that it did not happen another way. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, I've thought about it. And I'm like, I think I feel like everyone's, you know, thought about like what could have been, and I'm I'm glad that. That it wasn't that. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna risk a tangential turn here. Sure, um, go for it. How did you uh, meet your wife? 
for your partner because I saw your Instagram post where you said that she was a big help for you at MC Chicago and yeah. she seems like someone that obviously you guys are soulmates like how did that happen uh, is she an artist or is she no um, I always like no she's she's not an artist but I always tell her that she's very naturally observant like of those things like she's very intuitive about those things um, like I always ask for, like I always like ask her and to come take a look at my paintings. Like, hey, like what do you think about this? Like she's always the first, you know, round of feedback that I get mm. uh, when I'm like insecure about something. And she's usually very, what's the word that I'm looking for, James? <laughs> Just like naturally, you know, intuitive about those things. So we we met, actually met in Chicago about oh well, god i'm so bad with time seven years ago 2017 um and we met online and and that's not like the the romantic start that you want but you know it's just a start it's not about to start oh, no I've, i know lots of people who got married and have great relationships through me yeah. online yeah, yeah yeah my my sister met her husband on online so so that you know that's that's how you do it uh, these okay. days the internet you know did you know right away that she was the one? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew I liked her a lot. And, yeah. yeah. And the thing is that we were, like, we just met and then I went back to, because I was living in Mexico back then. Uh, and I went back and I was like, oh, crap. Like, I like I don't want to lose contact with this person. Like, I really like her. Like, I want to keep, you know, chatting. And then we talked every day. Like, since the day we met, like, we just, like, talked every day on um online and or on the phone um and i found like through you know because I'm, I'm freelance i can do whatever whatever i want so I, I i did um events here in the u.s and that was a chance for me to to visit so that's how we like kept going back and forth until until i moved here and we got married well what was it like for her to be introduced to the world of magic the gathering through you Oh, it was, it was... Put it, put it in through her <laughs> lens. What was it like? We can ask her right now. <laughs> um, no, but she's told me about it. She, like, when when I told her what I did, she was, like, um, not skeptical, but, you know, you always have stereotypes, right? Like, you stereotype people. Like, we're we're all, like, human, and we... Like, if we don't know... The stereotype is to be human, honestly. Yeah, know? like, if, if you don't know something, like, your your mind goes to the stereotype. And you have, like, preconceptions of what people are going to be. So I was like, like, this is, you know, Ma I work for Magic the Gathering. And mm. and it's a convention. And, you know, and we're all... We're all I mean, I was nerdy. Mm. Like, I could not hide it as much yeah, as I tried. Yeah, and then I the tried. images of the... No offense to cosplayers, but the images of cosplay and, like, all, all these heuristics come up, right? Yeah. Uh, and so we met at a, like, the second time we met, she came over to help out at, um, GP Atlanta. Uh, so, like, she, like, our second date, kind of, was yeah. her being with me at my booth at GP Atlanta. So it was interacting with all these people, like, you know, to getting like hands-on experience with like the magic community and the magic world. Yeah, just and right it, into the magic yeah, pool. Yeah, yeah, and it's, you know, you meet the humans of magic. Like, you have you have, you know, preconceptions and and everything, but you know, you meet you meet the people. Like, they're everyone's great. Like, and I feel like that that changed her her perspective. It's like you know, I thought it was, you know, a certain way, but you know, these people are great and. And they yeah. they are very passionate about it. Uh, she has a story. She kept this story about someone who who was very competitive, like this very competitive guy, but because of health issues, could not do sports, competitive sports. So magic was like his outlet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, stuff like that. You meet you meet great people at at these events. So. That was like her introduction to magic, and now like she knows all the names, um, and like from like also for like selling stuff, like I'm always like repeating um, 
yeah. like helping out the, at the she knows like this card is this and yeah that yeah and, and even at, at uh, Chicago like one of the the ones I signed the most is um I call it Stompy Giant because it's the, the giant that does stomp and then has the adventure cost. Oh, uh, Bone Crusher Giant. There you go. And I'm like, I have played know, that card many times. Yeah, there yeah. you go. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's Stompy Giant. And she's like Bone Crusher Giant. Mm. So, yeah, she's, she knows the nickname. Yeah, she, yeah, she's with <laughs> it. Yeah. This is such a fascinating one because Magic Celebrity is like its own thing and you're a magic celebrity so was it surreal for her to be like okay victor is just some guy but in the halls of this convention or gp hmm. he's now suddenly people are now suddenly lining up for hours to get an interaction with him yeah. like a handshake like a signature like can you like if you put yourself if you if you if you out of body experience yourself can you imagine like through her lens or other or a commoner a muggle's lens yeah like, what that's actually like can you describe it like, what is Magic Celebrity like for you? Gosh, that yeah, that's 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 really it's it's difficult to like see it from the outside. Like, I I know what people tell me, but you know, uh, when she introduces me, like, oh, he's he's like famous, like in a very small niche. <laughs> um, he's like famous within like a certain group. Yeah. Um, I never. But in that group, you're so famous. That's the crazy thing. Yeah, that's that's. That, but even then, like I, I feel like, because because you know about art, yeah, you talk about art, and the people that talk about art like know it, but a lot of people don't, or they, I mean, they see the art, but they're not like so in depth as we are. Um, like I'm not as famous as you know, some of the pro players. I'm not as famous as Gavin or uh, Mark Rosewater. You know, um, but, I don't know, you know about that. I feel like there are certain uh, spaces on for Magic Online, w online Magic, where mm -hmm. they are very well-known names. But I dare say maybe everyday players may know your name more just because you're literally printed on a Magic card. Yeah, yeah, that's. I I feel like now I'm used to it, but I've been doing it for so long. But yeah, it, it's it's just crazy. Like, it's it's always like the first times, like my first event. Um signing all those cards like i never thought i would do it um charging money to to sign cards like that <laughs> that's insane um yeah because you see it like i like i, I used to see it here at, at san diego comic-con like um all these deal i'm gonna i'm gonna call i'm, I'm gonna insult them but like dealist celebrities that no one cares about anymore <laughs> charging fifty dollars for an autograph you mean uh, some of the people now on Cameo doing these videos? All kinds of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I saw like one of the one of the Ramon Ramones uh, guy that was like in the Ramones for like two weeks, <laughs> <laughs> charging fifty dollars for a signature. Yeah, we're not uh, even talking about Pete Best or anything. Yeah, it's just a, a two week Ramon. And yeah. and and people like that, I'm like, that's that's insane. Like. If I'm if, minutes. if I ever get to be famous, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign stuff for free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I wish I I wish I could, but it's just so so much time. And and if I did it for free, honestly, they would get scalped. Yeah, it, it, yeah, they yeah. they would get they would get scalped. Um, and it's just so here's the, much time. Here's the point where I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna yeah. ask you what's the most memorable or strangest interaction you've ever had with a fan oh wow uh I, james i have a terrible memory uh like i remember like i feel like feelings. you're pleading the fifth on this <laughs> <laughs> no like i have a great visual memory like I, i've mm -hmm. seen like I've, I've interacted with fans you know 10 8 years ago and then i see them again and i'm like yeah like i, I remember you uh, you remember the face. I remember okay, the so face. Like, um, yeah, interactions. Yeah, there's been there's been so many. Um, that's that's definitely a question that I that I need to think about because yeah, like right now, you caught me at my sleepiest <laughs> and probably not <laughs> like not my best uh, brain moment. But I yeah, I would need to think about that. But there's there's like everyone's like really was cool. there anything any interaction that was like even emotional like maybe someone told you how 
much your work meant to them in some way. Yeah, uh, there was this this person, uh, Lisa. Uh, she was a uh, she's a girl um, that was attending an event, and and she came over to my booth. So I was just like you know me, and she started asking me questions, and we like chatted back and forth. Uh, and she's an artist too, and 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 a writer as well. So we started like talking. And then, you know, she went away. And that was, you know, a normal interaction, like um, how I go about with everyone at at events. And then she came back next day, and she gave me a drawing with a letter uh, written on the back. Like, I still have it. Like, it's one of my, it's one of my treasures. So she, she drew like a, like this fairy, ethereal creature. It's really good. Uh, and on the back, she said that that she was on a very low point mentally uh, at that time, and that you know basically I would I, like I I was human to her, and I was kind, and I was you know I was a good person to her. Like I took time, even though I'm like super famous, Victor. That's like how people see me on the outside, but I'm just the guy. Um, and that I was like really nice to her, and she she did not want to come back because she she felt so awful uh, on day two. Uh, she did not want to come back again. Like she was just depressed and didn't want to do it again. Uh, mm-hmm. And I get that. Like like these events are, you know, or if you like if you have social anxiety, like that's a lot. Um, mm-hmm. and like if you're if you're a woman a minority um, mm-hmm. a you know a, yeah some, someone like that you might you know feel sometimes uh, discriminated against I like I don't know what she was going through but then she wrote this letter that, that I was so kind to her and, and because of that uh, she came over next day too uh, for the event and that right. was really cool yeah there you go we, really we got cool. the answer yeah, I mean, you really lifted her spirits and kind of made her yeah. weaken, right? Yeah. Because you just don't know what's going on in someone's headspace. And you never do. The, and the smallest thing can really help them. Yeah, and and you, yeah, you never know the impact you have on people. Like just, you know, being yourself, being kind, and and just you know, pleasant, not not a not a mean person or anything. You're just like you know, a good person. You can have a great impact on someone. Is it difficult? Has it been difficult at times to stay cool uh, or calm during magic events? I would imagine yeah. that sometimes it can be quite a lot because uh, even Chicago, I heard I wasn't there. I was hoping to meet you there, but I, yeah. I, I heard that it was like incredibly like packed to the gills yeah. with it, it is people. taxing on the mind. Uh, yeah, and just like working, like day day one is fairly easy you're excited you're happy to be there yeah um, you got that like yeah. adrenaline kind of thing yeah. yeah or when i was younger i mean i'm i'm old i'm 35 but i'm I'm not like i was in my 20s like i, I can't like you know do late nights or anything like that anymore uh, so yeah you like start to run out of steam especially at the end like having conversations uh, with everyone like signing like doing doing the work And at one point you're like, I'm done. Like if your social battery runs out, it's out and you have to, you know, keep doing it. Uh, So that's, I feel like that's the hard part. Like I've never, I feel like I've never gotten cranky, Uh, but definitely uh, low battery. And I've been like, kind of like depleted, tired and, you know, and I apologize Mm -hmm. for like if anyone see me like that, but it's, it's just how, how it is after a long day. No, that's just part of being human. It's yeah. like, I don't think humans are meant to interact with so many people in one day or over a weekend. It's just pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just waving to my wife. I'm done telling her oh, to okay. come over. Do you we, want her we, in front of the camera? Or? Yeah. Do you want to be in front of the camera? We talked about, yeah. <laughs> How we met and stuff and your experience with the world of magic. <laughs> 
professional interview? Yeah, it's very professional. Hi. Hello. Hi, I'm James. Uh, I'm just interviewing Victor, just trying to get his background yeah. as a... Hey, I'm James. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm James. I'm just interviewing uh, from all the way over in China. I'm just trying to um, Amazing. get a sense for Victor's story, and he's... Uh, it's been super awesome. He's given me a lot of just honest, uh, just <laughs> being Victor. Him. <laughs> That's him. Yeah. He doesn't know how else to be, which I love about him. <laughs> yeah. And I was just asking Victor about, like, the weird sort of experience of knowing somebody and then figuring out they're a magic celebrity. Like, <laughs> what that's actually like. Because outside magic... Uh, normal, right? But right. then in magic, you have people yeah. literally lining up to get... Uh, his signatures. I know you were in Chicago, but mm -hmm. and you've you know obviously done these events and seen it. But like I was just asking him what it was like when you initially um, knew Victor and you experience and you experienced Magic the Gathering fandom for the first time. Yeah, um, I mean even not knowing Magic much, um, I still was impressed and surprised to know that people wanted his signature. I thought that, <laughs> I thought that was cool. I thought who is this guy? <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, then going going to the events, especially after not knowing each other for you know too long, um, I feel like I quickly got a lot of insight into his life and something that was a big part of his life. He played magic at a young age um, and met a lot of friends doing that. And then it was his dream to become an artist. So um, kind of getting to jump in midway through his story and see him living out his dream was really, uh, really cool. And I feel like made me feel connected to him quickly. Um, and also just the, the community of people of magic are just really amazing people. I think, you know, there's a bad, bad rap of, <laughs> you know, nerds or what, what magic is or what it means. And um, nerds are smart <laughs> and, and fun. Like I love games and uh, Victor's not a great teacher. Otherwise I probably would play magic myself. <laughs> <laughs> or speak um, Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's just an amazing community of people um, meeting the other artists and just chatting with fans all day long for three days in a row. Um, you know, I I would, and I didn't know how to, they don't, there's no training on sitting at a booth and selling things, you know, but so I would make mistakes and people would come back and say, hey, you didn't charge me enough. You didn't charge me for this. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, you didn't, you could have just, <laughs> I wouldn't have known, you know. Yeah. People are just very honest and genuine right. and authentic, and um, I felt very lucky to to have gotten to meet Victor and step into all of that um, from the get go. So yeah, it was fun. Mm. Okay, I I know you don't want to keep being in this interview, but I just want to ask you one thing <laughs> sure. before you go. What is something? What is one thing about Victor that most people don't know? Mm. Like that I wouldn't know about Victor. <laughs> that might be interesting to share to spill mm. the beans on in, in this interview mm, that's a good question these teeth are fake <laughs> that's one <laughs> that's, that's one. one um i mean oh, i don't know that's tough the first thing that came to mind although everyone knows it but i mean victor's from mexico but he has no accent so i feel like people forget that <laughs> a lot i do mm -hmm. um i think uh, i don't know how many if if many people know that Victor is colorblind, I think that that's um, wow. especially. Wait, how do you do magic art? Exactly. <laughs> you still mix. You still mix you just, green and red. Use green because again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, and I guess in Photoshop, I mean, he uses he does oil paintings, mm -hmm. but he starts mm -hmm. his initial sketch in Photoshop, and I guess it tells you the colors. Yeah, you can color pick, and then <laughs> and when you paint, uh, you read the tube, and it says what color it is, so you don't. Uh, it happened to me once. One time, I mixed. Uh, it was like a it was like a rust color, and I mixed it with with something else, and it got and it got green. And I couldn't tell. Uh, same with with uh, yellow and black. If you mi mix mm -hmm. yellow and black, you get green. And I mm -hmm. I didn't know. And mm -hmm. you know, I get I get people like her and be like, "Hey, why why is this this color?" And I'm yeah. like. There was one, he's, he's, <laughs> he's learned how to maneuver around it, but yeah. there was one painting yeah. where there was kind of a green fog, and I was like, are they supposed to look like they stink, or what's going on? <laughs> oh, <laughs> and yeah. he's like, oh, is this green? I thought it was whatever, but 
yeah, I mean, he's obviously mm-hmm. done very well for, him, for himself, but, you know, yeah. even with that. But, yeah. um, and I think colorblindness, especially that red-green, is, is pretty common among men. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I don't think too many people know that. I'm not sure. <laughs> or if they didn't, now they he's, do. <laughs> he's funny because mm-hmm. he's very confident, um, but he's also very I, I can humble. Tell. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell that, too. Um, I mean, you're <laughs> in an interview, so he's going to be honest and say things as it is but when we're around other people um i don't know he he's also humble and he's okay with keeping some things to himself and like enjoying some things for himself and not flaunting you know everything Mm -hmm. but he is confident Mm -hmm. too (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah ask me a math question (laughs) anything (laughs) <laughs> I, I'm gonna give you. I don't even know what to ask. I'm gonna give to you the wrong simple, answer, but simple. very confident. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. I see. Oh, okay. Right. So you, you know, you know your lane, or you know your do- the domains that you're, yeah. you you have confidence in, right? Which is art or um, creative work. Mm, that's a good mm-hmm. way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, because you have to you have to be confident. I feel like, um, in order to sell sell your work, you have to believe in it. And that's yeah. the thing, like, other people do. Why Why can't I? Right? Like, that's one of the, right. one of the first, like, hurdles. Why not me? Yeah, p- people tell you all the, like, people tell us all the time, like, your work's amazing. Uh, but, you know, it, it's hard for you to, like, believe it, especially if you compare yourself to other people, um, mm-hmm. other artists. Uh, you're like, not so much, but, yeah, you kind of you know, have to believe in yourself. Mm-hmm. That was a good question. I'm going to be thinking about that now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thanks for uh, for popping in. My here. pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for letting me interrupt. <laughs> yeah. Here you go. Thank you, babe. Uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Thank you, babe. Oh, that's that was an awesome interruption. Definitely keeping all of that in there. Yeah. Um, can we do like a just a rapid fire round? Is that okay? Yeah, let's do it. What's your favorite piece of magic art you've done? Lord of the Undead. Yeah. Wow, that was, that was fast. That was just fast. like that, huh? Uh, okay. I, I've been I've been asked uh, those questions and why a lot and why um, one it was the creative freedom uh, because it was my secret layer I could do whatever I wanted and two because it was a homage do you do you pronounce that homage homage to the original one which is the the Brahm I have it right here right there like I have oh, yeah. it, I have it like right here on my on my desk i wouldn't look at it all the time because it's inspired by that art yeah so like the sword is the same obviously like the style is different like i I did my own thing but uh he was always like one of the the ones that i looked up to when i started i still do Uh, so i wanted to keep like some of the elements the spirit of what he did um and yeah i love that art so i wanted to like translate that to to mine which is is actually um, Lord of the Undead is the same you know character that they used in uh, Drow New Lich Lord, and he just like I, they just like did this like took the same character like the sword and everything. I don't know if a lot of people know that, but um, they have like these like weird uh, heterous things, and the sword is the same. So it's the same character. It's just no legendary. I don't know if anyone. Mm-hmm. Um, still knows what creature I'm talking about, but it was pretty pretty big back then because you could do flashback. That was going to be my next question. Like, who are your biggest uh, artistic influences? So, hmm. aside from Brahm, are there others that come to mind? Um, yeah, I mean, there there's a lot. Uh, James Gurney, I have all all of his books on how to paint good. Um, yeah, he's definitely one. Um, I follow a lot of Western artists online uh mark margiotti and uh he's one of them um uh glenn dean he's another um cowboy artist um eric bowman uh michael wellen he's he's one of the the og fantasy guys uh yeah lots of my peers uh ryan pancoast um yeah, who else do I have here? Mark Zug, I have one of his paintings. Um, I have one one of Ryan's in, in the bathroom. <laughs> not not painting, just a print. But I, I love that. Um, 
Yeah, I, I admire lots of lots of my peers, uh, lots of magic artists. Like I, now that I'm doing this, and now I I real I thought it was it was easy, but like I admire how like dedicated and hardworking they are. Um, what else? Who else? Yeah, I have I have like folders and folders of reference. Like, yeah, just a bunch of artists from like current artists to to like the old old masters or the you know Renaissance Caravaggio type peoples. But yeah, I would say like James Gurney. I I follow his his um, teachings to a T. What is one thing that you wish people would know about the world of illustrating for Magic the Gathering that you wish people would know that is not known? Like, what's one thing that you wish you could just tell everybody about what it's like? There's, like, one very specific thing that I'm, like, trying to get the word out on right now, which is the paintings. Uh, and I feel like it, it's starting to, like, catch on, but it's not as, as big as as like it is to me because like for me that's that's like my whole livelihood like the paintings mm -hmm. and i wish people knew that there was like this segment of collectibles because i see like people collecting all sorts of like rarities and not rarities like you know weird things like um misprints and like rare cards um uh graded cards um all sorts of things and you know the best thing is a magic painting because there's just one like mm -hmm. there's however many black lotuses out there you know 200 300 i know people have made like random numbers um and you know there's the one ring but also i don't know also that painting <laughs> is one of one <laughs> yeah you're saying every magic original painting is one of one, so that is the truly ultra rare yes. collectible. By by just merit of what it is. It was not manufactured to be one of scarce. It was not, you know, planned to be scarce. It's just because it's a painting. Um, there's just gonna be one. Even if you try to replicate it, it's gonna be a little different. So yeah, I that, that's one of the things that I wish more people knew. I feel like a, you know, people assume, right? But I feel like it could be more widely known, especially mm -hmm. people that that collect like rare stuff. As a magic player who plays the game, mm -hmm. does that inform the amount of time or effort that you spend on the art? For example, knowing that uh, a piece of art is going to be on a common versus a rare versus this is for a major game changing card or this card or this art might be more desirable in some way you don't know 100 percent, but you may know mm -hmm. wow long-winded question here but like does that inform your decisions about, as an artist and my answer should be no i have to tell you no <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you know professional uh, all right yeah the, the official, official answer is no the official answer is no but also you you never know unless it's a reprint, um, and if it's a reprint, it's it's usually good. Um, mm -hmm. I I don't think I've done many reprints right now. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, yes, you should always try to do, you know, your best work regardless. But I feel like I, you know, back to the question of like finding joy or finding fun in whatever you do. I feel like if you do get a common, you know. You, you, one you never know it's going to be a common because they can shift rarities and they've done that a lot like I know with my pieces I've gotten stuff that I thought it was a common then shifted to mythic uh, stuff like that common to mythic okay yeah, like, I was you expecting never know. Like, it's common still, to uncommon like you, you oops I'm bumping and like you send out the art and then like there's still like time for them to adjust so you like you don't know like they can like bump it up and or you know change the power level like they can make it better like after the fact it it doesn't happen often but sometimes it does um but i i i feel like i haven't gotten an assignment that i'm like hmm that's a common anymore i feel like i'm doing i'm on a streak right now especially if they're legendaries you know they're going to be rare 
and I've gotten a lot of those uh, lately. Um, but having said that, if I were to get a, something that I think is going to be a common um, official answer, no. <laughs> right on. And not a rapid fire question. Okay. But tell me about this new project that you're working on. So I always had a story in mind, but I'm not a writer. Um, and I don't want to write. Like I started writing like a novel, like a normal novel a couple times. Like I have the story and like trying to like write it, but I'm one not, it, well, I mean, I'm not good at it because I haven't like done it. I feel like I, I would be good at it if I, if I was interested in it, but I, the truth is that I'm not. Um, so I want to like, I have a story and I had like this light bulb moment when I watched, um, uh, Mad Max Fury Road for like the umpteenth time. And I'm like, and I remember like they talked about that it had no like, um, traditional script, but it was a uh, storyboard. And I'm like, huh, like I would want to do that. Like, like I'm a, I'm a visual artist and I, I paint fast, s sorta. Uh, so I could probably like do that like why not uh, so i'm not a do doing a storyboard i'm doing like a regular comic book but it's it's gonna be more um uh, actually i got a that was actually one of the inspirations i got a miyasaki um manga and it's mostly art like it has text and story like it is a story it is it is a normal book but it's very art heavy um so i want to do that and it's going to be it's going to be a mix of uh, sci-fi and post-apocalyptic and some fantasy tropes, but it's going to be Western and it's going to have dinosaurs and fantasy, some fantasy races. When can we expect this uh, graphic novel or this work to come out? I don't know. Like I'm like I, I started, I did the, the outline. I, I wrote it. I need to do a rewrite. Uh, cause there's like a little plot thing that I, that I don't like. Um, but I'm, I'm just doing that right now. And then I'm, yeah, it's baby steps. Like I, I have no idea. I, I don't know what I don't know. Like, like I want to do 80 pages maybe, but I don't know the amount of work that's going to take. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's done when it's done, right? Yeah, when you feel it's done, especially yeah. when it's your baby. So you yeah. take your time. Yeah, and I, yeah. I have, I, I'm not in no rush to like monetize it or or sell it. Um, like that's going to be a passion project, and like I do want to, you know, not take a long time because I need to, I need to work as well. I need to make money as well. So like I would want to, you know, you know, just do it like at a normal speed, like same speed that I would do. A, a magic illustrator uh, illustration or or something else Excellent. 2026 <laughs> <laughs> 80 pages wow mm -hmm. i'm looking forward to that yeah absolutely so victor mm -hmm. it's uh it's been a pleasure talking to you for thank this. you you too um, this was fun yeah it's it's been so much fun i, I need to talk to artists more often or yeah, you, artists you, you as chill and cool as you are you should yeah. they're, they're all cool we're all cool okay thank you so much for Thank you so much for your time. Thank and, you so much. Uh, I wish you all the best. Thank in your, you too. In your other projects. Thank you so much.